folks in the back who's obviously a little cool Bible, can you turn with me this morning to... Uh, we'll start at Luke chapter 4. Let's go to Luke uh, chapter 4 this morning. We're going to start there. We'll see where we end up. Hey, we've been talking about, for a number of weeks now, uh, quite a period of time, we've been talking about three things that this collection of ancient documents that we call the Bible, three things that we are told not to do when it comes to uh, the Holy Spirit and our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about, uh, we started with do not grieve the Spirit. Everyone know that's in these ancient documents? Yep, do not grieve the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit with, uh, as a person, not as a thing, not as uh, any Star Wars fans here. Yep, the force be with you, Rod. It wasn't like that. The Holy Spirit is not a force be with you type thing. The Spirit is always referred to uh, as a person by Jesus. And so as you can grieve a person, well, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. And we're told, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And then we went on and we looked at, uh, don't quench the Holy Spirit. We can actually quench the Holy Spirit in our lives and around us. And then the third one we're told not to do was don't resist the Spirit. And so last week we looked a little bit at what resisting the Spirit looks like to us in a practical way. What I want to do now is move into the next few weeks, talk about three things that we are encouraged and told to do when it comes to our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We're going to have a bit of a look at that. We'll have a break next week when Ross comes, but we're going to dive back into that. This morning, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the first one. So uh, in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, we have this passage. I'm only going to read verse 1. Then from there, we go into the temptation passages where Jesus is tempted by the enemy. I'm going to skip that narrative in the middle. We're going to talk about the, what, the verse just before that and the verse just after he comes out of that. And in verse 1, it says, then Jesus being, what? Filled. filled. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was what? Led by the Spirit. So Jesus is filled by the Spirit. He returned from the Jordan and then he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Then in verse 14, it says, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. It says Jesus returned from that moment of temptation. It says he returned in the power of the Spirit. So here we have very briefly in the life of Jesus three things, that three interactions, positive interactions between him and the Holy Spirit. Number one, he was filled with the Spirit. And then once he was filled with the Spirit, the next logical sequence of events is that once that Spirit was in him, then that Spirit began to lead him. And then once that Spirit was leading him and he learned to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit, he was then empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to look at those three things over the next coming X amount of weeks. We'll see uh, sort of where we go with that. But we're going to look at these three things. We are told that we should be filled with the Spirit. We're told that we should be led by the Spirit. And I also believe that we should be empowered by the Holy Spirit as well. So we're going to take some time and look at that. We're going to just start today, and I want to talk about being filled with the Spirit, but I want to sort of maybe come at it from a little bit of a different angle than maybe I've preached it in the past. Um, First of all, let me start by saying this. If you are born again in this room, if you have pledged your allegiance to Jesus, you have handed your life over to him, multiple expressions, been born again, use whatever expression you want. At the end of the day, if you can truly say in your heart, Jesus, you are my Lord. I have surrendered. We sang this morning about I surrender. If you have truly surrendered your life, your future, your present, uh, your destiny, your plans, your purposes, if you've surrendered over to God and you've made the decision. See, repentance, we talk about faith and repentance. Repentance is not just a prayer. Amen? The word repentance was never meant to be a prayer. I'm just going to go and do the wrong thing and then I'm going to stand in front and just say sorry but I'm going to turn my back, but I'm going to stand there. So if I want to mark up again, and I've only got a, doesn't, not much effort to dive back into it. I'll just turn back around and play with it again. Oh, sorry, Lord, I'll turn my back on it. And I'll turn back around and play. Oh, sorry, Lord. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. It's a 180. It's a turning and actually walking away from that thing. So if I've rep- truly repented of something, it's actually more difficult to go back into it. I can't just turn around and play because I'm actually walking in a different direction to that thing. So repentance is more than just a prayer. And this morning, we're going to have a bit of a look at filled. And I want to throw this out too. There are many, many uh, ways that people will think about when I say, get, if I was to say to you, get filled with the Spirit, you would have many different connotations and thoughts and things about that. Um, maybe you, know, you would think, well, I'll come forward after church, you can lay hands on me and I want you to pray for me to be filled with the Spirit. Well, you can do that, That's, and people can pray for you, that's fine. 
You know, maybe, uh, maybe it's a certain type of person that you feel needs to pray for you to be filled with the Spirit, whatever that means. Uh, look, that's, that's fine. Maybe you feel you need to fast and pray as the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. I've just got to wait and wait and wait on God and be filled with the Spirit. And there's all kinds of uh, methodologies and ways that we sort of look at and believe and think and are taught and read in which we get filled with the Spirit. But I believe being filled with the Spirit is more than just praying a prayer and saying, well, Lord, just fill me and then waiting passively to see if anything happens. So we're going to look a little bit at what it means to be filled with the Spirit. To start with, I just want to say this. If you are born again in this place, I believe with all my heart, based on what I read in this collection of ancient documents, that you actually have the Holy Spirit in you. Amen? If you are born again and you have given your life to Jesus, I have unequivocal faith, based on my understanding of the Word of God, that you have the Holy Spirit in you. Even if you don't speak in tongues. This is my belief. Even if you didn't get a goosebump when you surrendered your life to Jesus, you didn't feel a goosebump or a hair went up on the back of your neck, it's not by feelings, it's not by uh, effort works, it was by faith, by grace that God poured his spirit into your life. Because to be a Christian, it's an acknowledgement that we need Jesus. I can't live the Christian life in my own strength. Who, is anyone better than me? Can you do it? I can't live the Christian life in my own strength. I don't have the willpower. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the strength to do it. And so I rely on God. And God, Jesus said, I'm going to send my spirit. He's going to come. He's going to dwell in you. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. Uh, the spirit empowers us. The spirit works through us. The spirit doesn't overtake us. Anyone ever hear the analogy when you're born again of get out of the driver's seat? Anyone ever come to Christ and someone said, get out of the driver's seat and let Jesus take the wheel? I, again, I love the analogy. I love the point, but it's a very poor analogy because Jesus doesn't take the wheel. He doesn't possess you and take control and make you do anything. What Jesus does is he hops in the passenger seat and he starts guiding and giving you directions. But you still, how many of you know, you still have the decision, don't you? You can still turn left when he says turn right. You can still put the brakes on when he says speed up. You still have power and control of your life. We are filled with his spirit, but we're not possessed by the Holy Spirit in the sense of he takes over control and we don't have a say in things. That's not how it works. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It's not just, oh, God made me do it. You know, no, no, no. No, no, no. Maybe he extended an invitation. Maybe he didn't and you just... Decided to do it anyway. Who knows? But if you're born again in this place, you've been filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 39. The first message that was ever preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said this to them. He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I love this next bit. For the promise, what's the promise? The promise is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. If you have given your life to Jesus this morning, that promise that he's talking about, it's a part of your existence. It's a part of your world. When you gave your life to Jesus, that spirit was placed inside of you. Paul the Apostle he preached this to the Corinthians, the Ephesians, and the Romans. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He says, by, For by one spirit, we we're all baptized into one body. One body. So if you're in the body of Christ, you can only be in the body of Christ if you are a born-again believer. And you can only be in the body of Christ if it's the Spirit himself that's placed you into that body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. In Ephesians 1.13, Paul says this to the Ephesians. He says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You've been sealed this morning with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a good thought? You've been sealed by God, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 8, chapter 9, he says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now catch this bit. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. He's not his. So if you are his, then you have the Spirit of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Now this is really, really important because so many people second-guess the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. 
because of some of the things that have been taught and spoken and they've heard and so on. I don't speak in tongues, and so I second guess. What well, does that mean? Because some people say I, I, I'm not because I don't, and, or I haven't done this, or I didn't get a goose bump, or I didn't fall over, or I didn't. And so is it really, you know, we've got all these things that are thrown there in the modern day church culture and maybe experiences and so on. Here's, here's my decision. My decision is I'm going to get my theology from what this collection of ancient documents say, not from my own experiences. Amen? Because I've had some really dumb experiences. <laughs> okay? I've been a part of some really dumb and weird experiences. I'm going to take what I believe about God from what these guys knew about God and the Holy Spirit wanted them to write down 2000 and, and beyond years ago that he wanted to preserve, that he wanted me in 2023 to know about him, which I find in this collection of ancient documents. But the truth is this, if you second guess the presence of the Spirit in your life, you're basically second guessing your own salvation. You're second guessing your own salvation according to what Paul wrote to the Romans. So I'm pretty sure here that if I walked around and said, are you born again, are you born again? And if you were and you know, you'd say yes. But it's amazing how many people I've been around who will say, yes, I'm born again, but I don't think I've got the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Will you? I think we've got to accept the fact, start by accepting the fact that, you know, you, ha- you were given the Holy Spirit the day you gave your life to Jesus. Embrace that. Start to believe that. Start to, to, to listen to that. Start to operate knowing that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Start to get out of bed each day and thank God for the presence of the Spirit in your life and start walking in that which you believe. And your experience will change as you start to line your faith up with what the Word of God teaches us. Amen? So we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we, we need to be very careful because somewhere in the church we have created, whether we wanted to do it or not, a two-tier spiritual system, haven't we? Ever, we, we had, we've had people come in here over the years and they'll ask me the question. Uh, after church, I'll come up to me and they'll say, uh, are you a spirit-filled church? And I think, what does that mean? Are there Christians here? Yes. Amen? If there are believers here, then yeah, they're, 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 the Holy Spirit is in them. They're the church. They're here. Of course we're a spirit-filled church. Matter of fact, it's impossible to have a non-spirit-filled church because you're not the church if you're not the body and you're not in the body if the Spirit didn't place you there. So the whole idea, are you a spirit? I know what people are trying to say. I know what people are trying to say. But what it does is it creates this sort of two-tier spirituality. Are you a spirit-filled church? Are you a spirit-filled believer? Are you a spirit... Everyone, anyone ever say that? Are you a spirit-filled believer? Well, I want you to confidently be able to say, well, according to Paul, I am. you might not think I am because I don't speak in tongues, or you might not think I am because my experience is different. You might think... But I'm, I'm, what I'm going to say is there's this guy called Paul 2,000 years ago, and according to Paul, I am. He thought I was because he said this, and and I believe what he said. So I understand what we're trying to say. I get it. But I think we've got to be very careful when we use terminologies like that because words matter. Amen? Words create. And we don't want to be creating this two-tier system, either in this church or any other church or between churches, who's spirit-filled, who's not. I believe that we all have the Holy Spirit in us. Now, I believe there's fruit that the Spirit produces in the life of a believer, but that fruit is not perfection. Who knows that? If you don't believe me, there's a letter in here to a church in Corinth called 1 Corinthians. Pick it up and read it. Some of the stuff going on in that church will make your toes curl and your hair fall out. And you'll question whether these guys even know the Lord. And then you'll get to around chapter 12 and then you're going to go, oh, what is going on here? Look at all these spiritual gifts that are happening. Paul's not denying it. He's saying, yep, the Holy Spirit's moving and this is where you get all your spiritual gifts and all this stuff's happening. So the presence of God was there. The Spirit was moving even though the people were imperfect. Amen? You don't have to be perfect. Stop sitting back thinking, because I stumble in this or I struggle with that, therefore the Spirit leaves me. I've heard people preach the Holy Spirit's like a dove. And doves don't like to put their feet on anything that's dirty. Then the Holy Spirit wouldn't land on any of you. I hate to break it to you, but none of you are clean enough for God, and neither am I. The Spirit would hover above until he ran out of energy and go find some other place. Probably go and land on a car. Probably some of the cars out there are cleaner than I am in the eyes of God. But this is just the way it is. So it's not about perfection. But here's the thing. Even though the Ephesian believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul still tells them what? They need to be filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, and I just want to have a little bit of a look at this concept, this idea this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says to the Ephesians, now keep in mind he's speaking to people who are filled with the Spirit. Right? They're born again, they're, they're worshipping God, they've already got the Spirit in them. But Paul says this to them, he says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. He says, but be filled with the Spirit. So is he saying to someone that's filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit? Yes, that's exactly what he's saying. So even though you're filled with the Spirit, he's saying you still need to be filled with the Spirit. 
Anyone's head going tilt, tilt, tilt? What does this all mean? You're filled with the Spirit, but he's saying you need to still be filled with the Spirit. Now, just to give you a little bit, a tiny little bit of Greek uh, in terms of the context of that passage, in the Greek language, this is a command. It's not an option. He's not saying, you know what, if you guys feel like it, be filled with the Spirit. If you get time, would you fill yourself with the Spirit? If it works in your daily planner and calendar, would you feel, if you've got five spare minutes, why don't you go and spend that time and fill yourself with, it's not an option. This in the Greek language is a command. He's saying to these Ephesian believers, you have to be filled with the Spirit. There's something of urgency and importance about being filled with the Spirit and what he's referring to here. Second thing is that it's not just for leaders or pastors or what you might consider to be elite Christians or people that you think are in the top tier or whatever. It, this is something that he's saying to all believers. So it's a command to be filled with the Spirit, but it's for all believers. So every believer that's filled with the Spirit still needs to be filled with the Spirit. Anyone's eyes rolling in their head yet? And thirdly, it's not written in the present, uh, sorry, it is written in what's called a present continuous tense. So what it means is that uh, if you broke it down literally in the Greek, it would say, don't be drunk with wine, but be being continuously filled with the Spirit. Be being continuously filled. So it's not a one-off thing. It's not like, okay, I came to Christ and I got filled with the Spirit. And Paul goes, oh, hang on. Now you've got to get filled again. Okay, so I've done it once when I got saved. Now I've got filled again. So now I've made it. I've got my two fillings and that's, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is you need to be continuously, continuously being refilled with God's spirit. Continuously. It's not a one-off thing. It's not something that just happens on a Sunday when I come to church. It's not something that should just happen when a, uh, you know, I follow the, the latest prophetic voice around or the new apostle comes to town or I go to this. This is something that he's saying should be happening all the time. So it's something that's within your personal grasp. No matter what you do, no matter where you work, where you go to school, how much free time you have, how busy you are, this is something that's in the grasp of every single believer in this room right now. It's a command and it's possible. And Paul's urging us going, you need to live a life in such a way that you are being continuously filled by the Holy Spirit. Amen? We can be continuously filled by the Spirit. So here's a question. How do we live out our Christianity in a way that we're being continuously filled with the Spirit? Now, I want to, some of you might have heard this analogy before, right? There's a guy called uh, D.L. Moody, a great American evangelist in the 19th century, amazing man of God. Somebody asked D.L. Moody one day, why do, you, why do you say that you need to be continuously filled with the Spirit? And D.L. Moody made this statement. He said, because I leak. Because I leak. Anyone feel like they leak? I'm going to be up front and say, I'm a leaky bucket. Any other leaky buckets in the room here this morning? I'm a leaky bucket. Now, here's the thing. I understand what D.L. Moody was saying. I get it because I leak. I understand the concept. But I don't really like the imagery that he uses because it makes it look like we are continually filled because of our deficiency. It looks like we're being continuously filled by God because of our deficiency. But I'm not exactly sure that that's the best illustration that could be used to explain what Paul's trying to say here. Do not be drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. That Greek word filled is a word poleru. Now, it has a couple of meanings. The first meaning, and the one that most of us think of when we think of this passage, is to make full or to fill something up. Like a cup, an empty cup, you just kind of fill it up. Poleru, you just fill it up and so on. Um, and so if I use Moody's illustration, here's, here's the way I see it. If being filled is about topping me up or filling me up, then why... Keep topping up a leaky vessel. I mean, if I own a bucket and it's got holes in it and it's leaking, is it smart to keep pouring good water into that thing knowing that the good water being poured into that thing is just going to be basically wasted and put to no purpose and be unproductive because it's just going to pour out the bottom? Anyone here with a leaky bucket at home and you just keep pouring water in it? Anyone? I would love to pray for you. What about a hose? Anyone had a hose on their car and the hose leaks? You know, you've got a, a leaky hose on their car. Anyone here? One of you young people have to. Because every young person at some point has a leaky hose on a car and you think it'll be okay. And then one day it pops. And Trust me, I'm speaking from experience here. I used to have a car that when I would drive it from Ballina up to Brisbane when I was in YWAM, I had to stop about every, I think it was 10 or 11 kilometres because the, the radiator hose was leaky and I'd stop and I'd fill it up at a servo and I'd make about 11 k's and the gauge and I'd pull over all the way to Brisbane, every 11 k's, stopping, refilling the radiator. But I was committed 
to getting there. So it didn't matter what it took. So that's one expression of it, is to, to top up or to fill up. But the problem with that is if something is deficient, a leaky hose or a leaky bucket or something, it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep pouring something into it knowing that it's going to be wasted, knowing it's not going to be put to good use. But there's another meaning to the word polera. And it, it means this, it means to bring something to its fullest expression. To bring to its fullest expression. Let me give you a couple of passages elsewhere where this word's used. Luke chapter 4, verse 21. And Jesus began to say that him. He's just stood up. He's opened up Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news and bind up, uh, the, heal the brokenhearted and set the... Ca- and, and spoken about the, the ministry Isaiah many, many years before had, had written down. This is what Jesus will do when he comes. Jesus comes, picks it up, reads it and goes, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's the Greek word poleru. In other words, today that scripture has been brought to its fullest expression in me. It's been brought to its fullest expression in me. It's not speaking of topping something up. It's saying what I've just read to you, what you've been reading for a long, long time in synagogues and so on for for decades, what you've been reading there is now been brought to its fullest expression in me. Watch this space. And we know that Uh, we know looking back that that's exactly the stuff that Jesus went about and did. In Romans chapter 15, Paul uses the same word when he talks about preaching the gospel and sharing the good news of Jesus. Verse 18 and 19, Paul says this, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me. Hang on to that word, through me. I'm not going to speak of anything Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. And then he goes on and explains what some of the deeds were. In mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and roundabout to Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. In other words, I'm only going to tell you what I have done. He said, I've got word and deed. How many of you know the gospel is holistic? It's not just about words. It's also, it also has an impact. It has an effect. There are deeds involved. Paul talks about the deeds that he's talking about here. He says signs, wonders, and miracles. But I do believe that the deeds of the gospel can also be helping the poor, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. It's, it's not just going, I think it's James says, if someone comes to you and says, I'm hungry, and you go, oh, well, be blessed in the name of Jesus, and off you go, I hope you find food. He said, that's not really what it's all about. If we have the capacity, we help. We're motivated internally to actually help meet the practical needs of people as well. And Paul's saying here, what I'm speaking to you, he said, because I had word and deed together, he said, I have fully, there's that Greek word, poleru. In other words, I've brought the gospel message to its fullest expression by showing both sides of it. It's not just words, but there's power to it as well. Amen? It's not just words, it's power. And so he's saying here that I have brought to full expression the message of the gospel. So this is the other meaning of the same word that's used here in Ephesians, where Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. So if I, if I chuck out the topping up, filling up idea for a second, and what if I adopt this idea of bringing something to full expression? Then be filled with the Spirit has something to do with bringing to full expression the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's got something to do with with allowing the Holy Spirit to have his fullest expression through you. The Holy Spirit wants to express himself through you. Right? So allowing the Holy Spirit to have his fullest expression through your life. Through your life. If we go back and we look at some examples of people who are already filled, these are people who are already filled with the Spirit. And if I can use, if I use Moody's term, these must be people who leaked. And we look at how they were continuously filled, then I think there's a bit of a pattern here. All right? So I want to throw a couple of verses at you here. Now keep in mind, every time Peter preaches in Acts, it doesn't say the Holy Spirit didn't make sure it was written in the text full of the Spirit or filled with the Spirit. Every time Paul did something, the Holy Spirit didn't make sure that every time Paul did or said it said he was filled with the Spirit or full of the Spirit. There's a handful of splatterings for some reason. Now, Why did the Holy Spirit leave it out in some places, put it in in some others? I don't know. But what I want to do is look at a handful of references where we have this expression, they do something filled with the Spirit or full of the Spirit or whatever. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, 
rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So what's going on here is they've just prayed for a sick person. Sick person has been healed. He's been preaching the gospel. He's been testifying to the reality of Jesus, brought before religious leaders, and begins to give a defense. So the context here where it says that, that, that Peter filled with the Spirit, the context here is that he's praying for the sick, he's preaching, and he's testifying. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, this is after they've, they've spoken to the religious leaders. They've been told, don't do this again, you naughty boys. We don't want to hear this message and so on. And they go back and there's a, a prayer meeting going on. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. The context here, they're actually praying after having testified to the authorities of the reality of God. This is the context of then all of a sudden they get filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter 7, verse 55, Stephen, uh, the first martyr in the New Testament, just before he's about to get stoned by the religious leaders, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. What's the context here? Well, he's testifying to all these people about the reality of Jesus. Acts chapter 13 and verse 9. Which says, then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked at him. There's this sorcerer called Elimus. And, and Paul is preaching the gospel and this sorcerer gets in the way and tries to disrupt what Paul is doing. And so Paul says to him, I think he, he declared, you're going to be blind, you're not going to see. And, and this guy couldn't see. But what's the context? The context, again, is he's standing there and he's testifying about the reality of Jesus. Acts chapter 13, verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. What's the context that verse is speaking into? Again, here's a group of people that are testifying of Jesus, the reality of God, preaching the gospel, and so on. Now, here's the thing that stands out in every one of those, is I don't see any situations there where they're standing and praying, Lord, fill me with your spirit. God just did it. Looks to me that, that God looked down and God just filled them. Why? What? I don't know. But I don't see anywhere there where they're spending all their time. I know people that will lock themselves away and just pray and, and keep them, like, do nothing but just pray, God, fill me with your spirit, fill me with your spirit, fill me with your spirit. Now, I'm not saying don't do that. If that's you, I'm not saying don't do it. Don't hear me say you shouldn't do it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when I look at the context in the book of Acts of when these people were filled, I don't see them locking themselves in a prayer room saying, fill me. Now, I haven't covered every single one of them because what we need to understand in the book of Acts as well, and we'll talk more about some of this stuff in the weeks to come, is that we're talking about a transition from an old covenant to a new covenant. We're talking about the Spirit initially being poured out in different situations, and there's a missional context to some of that. But what we're seeing here in each of these situations are people who already had the Holy Spirit, but referencing the fact that they were filled with the Spirit again, which sounds like what Paul's trying to say, be being continuously filled with the Spirit. Well, how do you be being continuously filled with the Spirit? Well, one thing I notice here is they're not sitting in a prayer room praying, saying, God, do this, but God's doing it anyway. So what's going on? I think what's going on is instead of praying, God, fill me with your Spirit, they're actually making room for more of the Spirit. They're making room. See, I can't fill myself. God does the filling, but I make the room. I make the space. How are they making space? How are they making room? Well, if we go back to Paleru, I think when you're praying, you're allowing the Spirit to give full expression to what He wants to do on the inside of you. Your flesh doesn't want to pray. The devil doesn't want you to pray. But when we allow the Holy Spirit in us to have His fullest expression through us, and that sounds to me a lot like what I'm reading here. The Holy Spirit expressing himself through testifying to people about Jesus. The Spirit of God expressing himself through prayer. The Spirit of God expressing through worship. The Spirit of God expressing himself by praying for the sick, by caring for the needs of people, by doing all that kingdom stuff that Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, all this stuff. By doing all that stuff and stepping into that space, it's almost like I've got the Spirit in me and I'm pouring the Spirit out of me into the lives of others and into kingdom stuff. And as I'm pouring out, there's this sense where I'm being continuously filled. I can't empty myself of God because there's just too much of God. There's too much of the Spirit. And God wants to pour His Spirit upon us. And Paul says you've got to learn to be continuously filled. And what I see here is a bunch of people who are being continuously filled in the context of continuously giving out for the kingdom. 
They're giving out for the kingdom of God. God fills us, but we make room. Uh, I asked this morning, so this is our water jug. Who likes our water jug? Don't tell fibs, because I fill it every morning and no one ever drinks out of it. Okay, so if you really like it, start drinking out of this water jug. That's a good water jug. But those of you that, that can't see, here's how this water jug works, right? So I want you to imagine, here I am, and I come to faith in Christ. And Jesus fills me with his spirit. I'm not going to fill the whole cup, it'll take an hour. So Jesus fills, fills me with his spirit. And I come over here to Jackie, and maybe she's sick, or maybe she's hungry, or maybe she's naked, or maybe she doesn't uh, have uh, uh, a relationship with God, and so I'm talking to her about him, or whatever the many things are that I can do that the Spirit wants to express the reality of Jesus through me. So I come over to Jackie, and, and I share the gospel with Jackie. Do you want to have a bit of a drink of that? You don't like that water, do you? Okay. Well, let's imagine that she did. Poor illustration. I should have asked someone else. Owen would have done it, wouldn't you, Owen? Yeah, see, so, I, so I'm going to minister to Owen now. You missed your shot. I'm going to minister to Owen. I come over here and Owen's naked and I'm clothing him and he hasn't heard the gospel of Jesus, so I'm telling him about it. And so I'm pouring out of my spirit. Now, here's what happens amazingly. I want you to imagine that this bottom tray here is you. This top tray here is actually filled with water as well. And as I press that button and pour out of the bottom tray, you know what happens? The top tray is already at the same time pouring back in. So imagine that's you and you're pouring yourself out. You're allowing the Spirit to express himself through you and you're being refilled by a higher power, higher chamber. You're being refilled by God. So as we pour ourselves out, God pours back into us. Jesus actually put it this way in John chapter 7. Here's what Jesus said. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. 39. 37 to 79, as if. 37 to 39, here's what Jesus says. It says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. The next one. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, or out of his belly, some say, will flow rivers of living water. Then it goes on, it says, this he said, he spoke concerning who? The Spirit. That those who believing in him would receive. Who's going to receive it? Those who what? Believe in him. So if you believe in him, you're going to receive the Spirit. It says the Spirit hadn't come yet. But Jesus, speaking in advance, goes, here's how it's going to work. The Spirit is going to be given to you. You're going to receive the Spirit, but out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. In other words, the Spirit is not going to fill you like some kind of a dam where you keep it all to yourself. If you want to be continuously filled, it's going to be poured into you, but it's going to also flow through you and out of you to the people and the world around you. So God fills us with his spirit so that we can pour out. So if I go back to D.L. Moody's illustration, D.L. Moody's illustration makes it look like we are filled because of our deficiency. I think we're, we're filled because of our productivity. I think we're refilled continuously because of our productivity, not our deficiency. We are all deficient. We are all deficient, but I think it's productivity. I think about the parable of the talents. The guy gets given this and that and that, and they went and used what they had. They did something for the glory of the master, and they got more given to them. And I wonder, I just wonder, if the Greek word, if the usage of full and filled here is this reference of Peleru, then it makes more sense that as we give the Spirit more freedom to express himself through us, as we live our lives with an awareness of the Spirit in us, and we allow that Holy Spirit to move through us and to bless other people, instead of storing it all up to ourselves, my relationship with God, it's all about me and what I can get out of God, and I'm always asking God for more. See, sometimes I think people feel like they're spiritually dry and spiritually empty, and you know why? It's because if you leave a pool of water stagnant in a bowl long enough, it starts to get icky. It's not meant to sit in there. Jesus said, out of your belly or out of your heart will flow rivers. Rivers. It's a moving stream. It's not something that's stagnant or stops. And so God fills us with his spirit and wants that Holy Spirit to have its fullest expression through us. Don't be drunk with wine. What happens when you're drunk with wine? You take that into you. Eventually that wine begins to show its influence through you. It takes control. It, it, it dominates influence, and before you know it, you're acting, acting like an absolute clown. You're saying things that you're embarrassed about. You're doing things you wish you didn't do because you've given yourself over to that influence. You're basically allowing alcohol to express itself through you. Well, what Paul's saying here is we need to learn to allow the Holy Spirit to express himself through you. 
When you feel to pray for someone, that's the Spirit wanting to express himself through you. When, when you want to share the gospel with someone, that's the Spirit wanting to express himself through you. When you want to help the poor, it's the Spirit expressing himself through you. And the only way that we make room to be continuously filled is we allow that expression. And we allow the Spirit to be received coming to us, but to flow through us like a river. Don't damn the Holy Spirit up inside of you. There will be people in this room this morning, and some of you are here, and I know from talking there are some people here, and you've really felt in the last probably eight weeks this real stirring of the Holy Spirit in your life. And we've been talking about this for a while, but there's just this sense in which the Spirit's stirring something up inside people's hearts, and we're feeling uh, uh, just that, 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 that greater desire to allow the Spirit to express Himself, not just here on a Sunday, but in our world. We're talking to people, and we're praying for people, and there's things happening. But there'll also be people here, and you, you're, you're feeling spiritually dry, and you're feeling like, what's going on? I want to just leave you with this thought. You can... You can run up the front and say, someone lay hands on me, pray for me to be filled with the spirit I need. And, and that's fine. You can do that. I'm not saying it's wrong. But maybe, I wonder, maybe, 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 just a thought. Maybe it's because God has already given you his spirit, but you've just damned it up on the inside. And you're not allowing the spirit to express himself through you. So you're feeling dry, not because you need more in you, but you need to let something out of you. You need to let the spirit of God begin to express himself through you in the ways that he chooses. Amen? Amen. What I was going to do this morning, I'm not going to do it now. What I was going to do was this. I was going to ask everybody that feels really like God's doing something and, you know, feeling stirred and so on, to come on up the front here. And then what I was going to do is ask everybody in this room that feels like they're dry and nothing going on, I was then going to ask them to come up and pray for these other people. Because sometimes we, sometimes we miss that element of giving to receive. And we get to the point where we're just waiting for, pray for me and do this and so on. And, and, and so I'm hoping this morning, I'm hoping this morning, maybe looking at that, this call to be continuously filled. Maybe, maybe some of you here, you don't need someone to pray for you or do something for you. Maybe you need to pull the plug out and start letting some of the good uh, stuff the Spirit has inside you. You need to start letting some of that stuff flow out and be a blessing to other people. Amen. So being filled with the Spirit could be allowing the Holy Spirit to fully express himself through you in service to God, others, and for the building of the kingdom. Amen? Just a thought, something to think about this week. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for uh, arising. I want to thank you for what you're doing here. I want to thank you for these people. What a great morning, Lord, to dedicate a baby to you, Father. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, God, Holy Spirit, if you're speaking to people, if there's stuff here this morning, You've been speaking to people through the worship, through the dedication, Lord. Maybe even now as we have coffee, there'll be conversations going on. Holy Spirit, we invite you into those conversations. Speak through us, use us, God, to be a blessing to others, God. Father, I just pray, anyone that the Spirit is speaking to, Lord, do not let them get up and walk away and just have a blasé attitude to what the Spirit of God is doing. Lord, I pray they would grab someone, they would speak to someone, they would pray for someone, ask someone to pray for them, whatever it is, Lord. God, we want to, we uh, Lord, take a bit of responsibility for our own growth in you as well, Lord, our own spiritual maturity. And so, Father, I pray for those people, Lord. Just don't let them get away, I guess, in Jesus' name. And, Father, as we leave this place, the next seven days, Lord, there are people out there that are dry. And, God, they need a little bit of Holy Spirit to flow out of us like rivers of water and pour into their life. Would you give us divine opportunities this week to bless people out there that don't know you, God, to point them to the way, the truth, and the life, to point them to the person of Jesus. And Father, we ask this in your name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.